Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden, and today I'm here with part two, which is the final part of my September wrap-up. I'll link part one down below, where I also will list all the content warnings for the books I talk about, um, and any other links or channels that I mention, and let's get into it. So the next book I have to talk about is Charmed Life by Marty Dumas. This is the second book in the Wild Witch um, Wild Seed Witch series. I don't know how many there are going to be. Um, our main character is Imani. In the first book she discovers that she has magical powers and she ends up getting sent to like a literal charm school um, over the summer. It's kind of a cross between a magical boarding school and like a finishing school. Um, and this book is set like after that summer um, and a lot of things have changed. Imani does feel more comfortable in her power but she also has learned a lot more about the way that magic works and it's made her pretty wary about using it. Um, and we also of course have some like friendships and some conflict carrying on from the first book. Um, and I ended up really liking this one. It did take me longer to read than I expected because there were parts of the plot that just didn't pull me in as much as in the first one. Um, but overall I did like this. I really really like Imani as a main character. Um, I I also love how unashamedly girly she is. Like she has a makeup beauty channel and that's really fun to like kind of follow a little bit in the story. And I really liked Imani's um, character arc over the course of this book or like kind of starting in the first book and continuing into this book um, because even though like it could sometimes be, I don't even want to say frustrating because I like I understood it, it was not always easy to like see her refuse to use magic in the way that she needed to, I definitely understand why she did it. And I actually kind of liked that the things that she has found out, um, I'm trying to be vague, but like the things that she found out in the first book have genuinely like affected her. Like she is, she is really responsible and I liked seeing that. Um, I also enjoyed some of the friendships here. Um, and also as regards to the magic, I think that this book is one of the ones that actually makes the reluctance to have magic powers or use magic powers like actually convincing. I also want to mention that I listened to a chunk of this on audio. I'll put the narrator in captions because I forgot to write her name down, um, but I thought she did a great job, especially for Imani's voice. Um, I just really, really enjoyed that. So I liked this overall. Again, the plot wasn't my favorite. Like I didn't enjoy it as much as the first book, um, but I'm excited to continue the series and I gave Charmed Life four stars. Next, I finally finished Touchstones by Stephanie Burgess. This this is a collection of short stories. They all have some kind of fantastical element and a lot of them also feature some kind of romantic element. Um, some of them are more on the paranormal side, some of them are more like whimsical or kind of general fantasy. Um, there's a couple kind of fairy tale feeling ones, so there's like a good amount of variety in here. Um, and if you guys have been watching my wrap-ups, you know like I I have been struggling with Stephanie Burgess. There's been one book of hers so far that I really really enjoyed, but I keep trying her <laughs> because like her stories always sound like things I should love. Like I really thought I was gonna really like this collection or at least a significant number of the stories and I really didn't. Like it took me so long to read this. Um, I mean I should I should rephrase that. Like I ended up stopping in the middle of a story because there were things about it that were frustrating me and I just kept not wanting to pick this book up even though when I did actually sit down to read the stories they tended to read very quickly um, and there were a few I liked but like for the most part this collection just really encapsulates a lot of the things that I don't like about Stephanie Burgess's um, books that I've read so far or that I've tried to read because I have a DNF that I'm going to talk about in a minute too. Um, like a lot of it has to do with the way that she writes female characters. Um, her characters have like strong, not like other girls vibes um, in pretty much every, every series that I've read from her except for ironically the one where the main character literally isn't a girl, she's a dragon. <laughs> Um, she's a dragon who's been turned into a girl. Um, and it's just, it's very frustrating. I know that I have a much lower tolerance for that trope than a lot of other people do, but I just find it pretty unbearable in her main characters. Um, and a lot of the characters in this story had that same problem. There were a few stories in particular that like the internalized misogyny was like really distracting. Um, like I, I really didn't like that. Um, and then also something I've noticed across all these stories and like the majority of things I've read from her is like her female characters are never allowed to be friends with other women. Like the only way they can get along with other women is if they're romantically involved or if they're related, um, which those relationships are very important as well. But I just find it very odd and sad that like in so many, like this, this has, I forget how many stories, but it's a lot. Plus the novels I've read from her, none of the women are friends with other women. And I just, I don't like that. Um, and then also, like her writing style itself is fine, I enjoy it, but the way that she executes the tropes and the ideas of these stories and of her books in general just really don't work for me. Like it's the kind of thing where 
if I like were to look at a description of a story or of a novel by her, I'd be like, oh yeah, I probably would like that. But she just does it in ways that I don't enjoy. Um, like some of the concepts for these stories I liked, but I just didn't like how they played out. And then also something I noticed for, again, most of the stories in this collection are they were just very like flat. Like the characters and the relationships were pretty lifeless to me, um, which I think is especially a problem when a lot of these stories are so focused on like the characters and relationships. And I have read authors who can write these kinds of romantic focused stories in very few pages in ways that are still interesting or convincing or enjoyable. Um, like Rosamund Hodge does that for me. Um, I read a collection by Tansy Rayner Roberts recently where like her stories are incredibly short, like basically microfiction, and I found them a lot more convincing than like some of the stories in here. Um, so yeah, like I just, I was not having a great time. I ended up giving this three stars because there were, there were like some stories that I genuinely did enjoy, um, especially near the end of the collection. There were like three or four that I actually really liked and that made me happy I didn't just give up on the collection. But like as a whole, this just really was disappointing. Like I'm glad I didn't DNF it, but most of the stories here were not a hit for me, so I gave Touchstones three stars. Um, and then speaking <laughs> of DNF, one that I did actually quit reading, and I so far do not regret that, um, I'm going to talk about Good Neighbors by Stephanie Burgess as well. I did not read it after this one, but I thought it made sense to talk about it here. So this is a bind-up of a bunch of, like, cozy, creepy, paranormal romance stories. Like, they're, they're a series, so they all follow the same characters, and they're kind of like vignettes. Um, and I think she originally published them online and now this is like her indie published collection of these. Um, I also listened to the audio for this one. I got almost halfway, like I got pretty far in this book before I just like gave up. Um, and it wasn't the narrator's fault. Like I think the narrator, she did a good job and she was probably the reason that I could bear to read as much of this as I did. Um, so we're following our main character Mia who um, she does, she has magical abilities and she does some kind of like inventions with them. At the part I stopped we didn't have like a ton of details about it yet, but um, a lot people in the towns that her and her dad live in always end up uh, distrusting her and hating her because of these like weird experiments that she does. Um, and we're, we're kind of hinted at that like the experiments are not what other people think they are, but um, people end up kind of chasing out her and her dad uh, from these various towns. She's finally moved to a new city with her father, and they're, the two of them are really close. Um, so they're finally in a new community, and there is a necromancer who has this castle, and um, Mia... What's, what's, it, what's the guy's name? Leander Fabian, of course it is. Um, so Mia ends up crossing paths with him, and of course sparks fly. Um, yeah, so I, as I said, I gave up on this, but I do feel like I have so, like enough thoughts that I can talk about it. Although, as I said, like I haven't read the whole thing, so I didn't read it, rate it on Goodreads or anything. Um, although I feel like at the point I gave up, it was hard for me to picture this getting higher than like a two stars. Um, for me, maybe a two and a half. So this has a lot of the same problems I was talking about with Touchstones. Uh, there's a lot of Not Like Other Girls vibes. Our main character does have one woman who she ends up becoming more friendly with, but it's sort of like a variation of the Not Like Other Girls where it's like this woman is like a much older kind of cool aunt figure, um, which is better than nothing, but I feel like I've noticed this with some other authors as well. It's like if those are the only kinds of like female friends you can have, it kind of starts feeling like, okay, so women are competition unless they're too old to be a threat to you and then you can be friends. Um, which, you know, just in the context of the other things that I've read from this author, I just, I have some reservations. I also just could not stand the main character. Again, like the looking down on other women and the just being just being like so special and interesting because she likes to do invention things which other women don't um, or just like people in general. I will say that it wasn't always I'm not like other girls. A lot of times it was, but sometimes it was just I'm not like other people. <laughs> Nobody understands me because I'm just so different and special. Um, although of course it was written in a way that Mia clearly thinks this is a bad thing, even though the reader can tell that she's actually just fascinating and unique and wonderful. Um, and I also really did not like the romance here at all. Leander was like, he was fine, like he's not my favorite kind of love interest, but he wasn't awful. But the thing that I hated about the romance is like how obtuse Mia is. And like, let me just say, I totally understand being like very, like having like low self-esteem or being like very, um, like, reluctant to believe that somebody genuinely likes you. Like, I totally get that. I totally get that. But 
in this book, it was to the point that it was actually ridiculous and obnoxious because like Leander does, like he is so obvious about the fact that he's romantically interested in Mia, that he's attracted to her, that he likes her, that he likes spending time with her. Like the things that he outright says to her, I'm like, there is absolutely no reason why Mia should be like thinking the things she is. Like it just, it was so annoying and yeah, it just, I couldn't take it. And then also, those were like the main issues, but I have to say too, one of the things that was distracting me is like the questionable ethics of some of this book, which maybe I was like, I don't know, putting too much thought into it and I was just supposed to have a good time with the romance, but because I wasn't, I was paying attention to other things. And um, one of the, one of the big things about how like the other people just aren't like our two main characters is that like a lot of the other townspeople in other towns, um, they really, really horribly mistreat these, like, zombie creatures, like, reanimated dead people, um, but they're not, like, scary, but the way other people treat them is just, like, really, really awful and disturbing, um, and I totally agree with our main characters that that is unacceptable and that they should not be treating these poor creatures like this, um, or poor people, so I agree with that, but <laughs> I feel like it's a little weird that at no point are we even meant to question like where the characters are getting these dead bodies because like I also think it is wildly unethical to just like go grave robbing and like reanimate corpses <laughs> of other people's loved ones. I just found that incredibly weird and we do know that like Leander a lot of the um like a lot of the ones that he has or maybe all of the ones he has at the beginning of the story that he actually got like left them by another person so maybe that's kind of how we're supposed to explain it, that it was like this bad person who did this. Maybe we're supposed to think that these, like the necromancer um, is like never going to create new zombies, but like he's known as the necromancer. So I don't know. That was just like yet another thing that I didn't like, that I had questions about. And I resent that we were just supposed to have like a cozy, spooky, romantic time with this book when, I don't know, there were some issues that I considered pretty glaring or distracting. Um, especially because, like, the book is really beating us over the head with how, like, nice and wonderful and, like, ethical our two leads are, unlike everybody else. And so it's kind of weird that there was, like, what I consider a pretty big plot hole for that. Um, anyway, I did not like this. As I said, I did not officially rate it, but um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend based on the almost half of this that I read. Next, I finished The Book Smugglers by Anna James. This is the fourth, I think, book? Uh, yeah, fourth book in the Pages & Co. series, which I'm buddy reading with a couple of friends, and this has been my least favorite in the series so far. Like, I still liked it. I still love the cozy vibes. I love our main characters. I love the friendships. Um, so there's a lot of things I still enjoy about it. The book wandering, of course, is always fun, but I didn't like the plot or, like, the conflict of this one nearly as much. Um, like, just in general, I'm not loving the antagonist angle of these books, but, like, this book specifically, I just didn't care about the plot. I wasn't interested, and even though I really liked some of the new characters that we're following here, like Milo, for example, I found, like, the plot involving him and some of these other characters to be really uninteresting. Um, and also, this book does this thing where, like, I feel like it's supposed to feel like we're getting more answers because we're finding out that, like, this thing is connected to this other thing and this is connected to this person's plan and this bad guy is actually working with the other bad guys and, like, all this different stuff. I think that is supposed to be, like, explaining more to us, but I feel like I'm getting more confused. <laughs> I don't know. Like, maybe, maybe it's just, like, maybe it's just me, um, but I feel like the way that this book particularly is like pulling all of these different plot threads together, it's actually harder for me to keep track of like who's doing what or who knows about what or anything like that. Um, so anyway, like I liked this, but didn't love it. I give the book smugglers, I think like three and a half stars. Um, so still good, but not my fave. The next book I have uh, to talk about is one that I do own, but I can't find it, which is apparently a new tradition here, uh, but that is Nocturna by Maya Motain, and I did listen to this on audio as well. The, the narrator was Kyla Garcia. I thought she did a fantastic job. Um, so this is a the first book in a fantasy series that is set in a world that is kind of recovering from being colonized. Um, they just recently were finally able to, like, kick out um, the people who had 
come in and taken over, and it is inspired by Latin American countries being um, colonized by Spain. I don't know what the background of the author is, but I do know that that is what she was inspired by and that her family background is uh, Latin American. So we are following two main characters, um, Alfair and Finn, I think are their names. Um, so Finn is a thief who has a magical ability to like shapeshift and change her face. Um, she can basically imitate anybody. Um, and then Alfair is the prince, and he actually is now the crown prince because his older brother um, was like something really terrible happened to him. Um, everybody's treating him as dead. Alfair feels like there is still a chance to get him back, um, but he's really, really grieving. Like his whole family is, the whole country is, um, but especially Alfair. He was very close to his brother and he's taking this really hard. Um, and the two of them, their paths end up crossing when Alfair makes a really big mistake. Um, he he does something because he's trying to bring his brother back and that un unleashes this like magical evil on the land. Um, and so him and Finn are kind of forced to team up to try and uh, track this, this thing down, this person down, um, and defeat them before they can do a lot of harm. And this evil entity that they are um, up against is also tied to uh, somebody from Finn's past who did her a lot of harm as well. So it's funny because I was just talking about like a couple books ago about, you know, DNFing books and um, one that I was glad to DNF and, and all of that. But this is a great example of why I don't DNF super often. Um, I know a lot of people take pride in how often they DNF. That's something I hear a lot about um, people making it a reading goal that they want to DNF more easily, and I totally get that. For me, I am very content with how rarely I DNF, and one of the reasons is that I come across books like this, because um, if I were somebody who DNF'd more easily, I probably would have quit this book in the first quarter, just because I really wasn't clicking with it, I wasn't pulled in, I wasn't super engaged in the characters or the story. Um, I found kind of the, the initial like big plot stuff that was happening, uh, specifically with Alfair and the reason that all of this bad stuff happens, I found that pretty frustrating. So there were just things that weren't working for me with it, but I ended up really, really liking this book and I'm really glad that I finished it. Um, I ended up really loving Alfair and Finn as characters. Um, I was especially, like, I, I pretty much enjoyed Alfair from the beginning or from very early on in the book. It took me a little longer to warm, warm up to Finn just because I feel like her kind of, like, tough prickly thief girl is a character archetype that is not uncommon, but it's it's one that I don't automatically gravitate to. Um, but I ended up thinking that she was really well written, and I think she had a lot of depth, and I ended up really caring about her as well. I thought the world and the magic was super interesting. Um, I really loved the themes of this book, um, like the way that it deals with colonization and recovery from that. Um, it also deals with grief a lot, and also it I think the way that it uses the antagonists to kind of look at evil and the way that humans can do plenty of evil on their own. I just think that was incredibly smart and really, really well handled, especially regarding like Finn's story and kind of her past and everything. I think that was incredibly well written. Um, I also really liked the developing relationship between our two leads. Um, I actually would have liked to have even more kind of time or like more like content around the kind of growing romantic interest they have in each other because um, I thought it was really well done. As I said, I thought the magical powers were super interesting and especially like the way that people's magic is tied to like their family. Like I thought that was very cool. Um, there were parts of the magic that I found kind of confusing or hard to follow, but like I overall enjoyed the element of the book. Um, and then also I really admire the way that the author like dealt with hard choices in this book. Um, the way that our characters are are forced with options where none of them is really good. Um, they're trying to do the best they can and they're trying to do the least harm possible and sometimes that still means doing something that hurts people or doing something that you don't want to and I just thought that was really really well written and really interesting. So I ended up really liking this one. Again, I'm very glad that I finished it. Um, I gave Nocturna four stars. Next, I finished Botanical Folk Tales of Britain and Ireland by Lisa Schneidau. Um, this was a present from my lovely friend Hannah from Ball Gowns and Books, so thank you so much. Um, I really loved this. This is a fairly short collection of, as it says, um, folk tales from Britain and Ireland that specifically involve or are focused on 
plants, um, like plant life in some way, and I really loved this. Um, I thought it was so cool how this was organized by growing season, um, like seasonally throughout the year, and kind of t ordering the stories in that way I thought was very cool. Um, I loved the variety here. Like, I would say the majority of these stories I was not familiar with, um, and that was cool, but it was also very interesting to, like, pick up on certain elements that were familiar. I really loved the writing, and I also really loved the kind of context notes. They're very, very short that the author provides, like, introducing each story. I feel like they were very concise, but it was, like, the perfect amount of, like, interest and background. I thought that was done very well. And I also thought it was very interesting or cool how varied the kind of endings or messages of these stories were. Um, like, not necessarily, like, the moral or anything, but um, kind of the, the central theme or the central idea you take away, um, or even, like, how things turn out at the end of the story. Like, I thought it was really interesting that that was hard to predict. I kind of liked that. Um, you know, like, you wouldn't necessarily... Like, if a character makes the mistake of, like, following, you know, a fairy into the forest, it doesn't always end badly, and it doesn't always end the same way, and I just thought that was very cool. So, um, yeah, I thought this was great. I gave Botanical Folktales of Britain and Ireland four and a half stars. Next, I finished The Scandalous Confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch by Melinda Taub. Um, if you guys have been here before, <laughs> if you've been here a while, you know that Melinda Taub wrote Still Starcrossed, which I love. It is one of my favorite books of all time, um, and it is a Romeo and Juliet retelling following a couple of very, very minor characters from the play after the events of that play. Um, and so this is the first novel Melinda Taub has written since then, which was like around 10 years ago, so I am ecstatic <laughs> that she has another book that I can love. Um, I actually have a full review on this one. This was an ARC that I received in exchange for that review, um, and I'm so, so grateful, obviously. Um, so I will link that below if you want more thoughts, but this is basically a historical fantasy um, Pride and Prejudice retelling that specifically centers Lydia Bennett as the main character, um, and I really loved this. I can see like, there, there are certain things about the way this is told that are very interesting and very unique, but I think also would be kind of a deal breaker for people. Um, like, Lydia as a main character is a very particular flavor, <laughs> but I really loved her. Um, I went into this book, like, I love Jane Austen and I love Pride and Prejudice, um, but I have always felt really bad about the way that Lydia is treated. Like, there are things that I find very frustrating about her, and there are things that, like, I definitely think she is an incredibly selfish person, but I don't think she deserves what happens to her in the original novel, and um, I went in with a little bit of, like, sympathy for her around that, and um, yeah, I thought she was really well characterized here. I love the writing style itself. I thought the blend of the historical and the fantasy elements was really brilliant. Um, I do think the narrative structure of this book was kind of, not hard to follow exactly, but it was kind of an unusual choice, and I don't think it always worked for me perfectly, but, like, the writing itself is so good, the characters, the ideas, the relationships, um, the fact that this is so, so clever as a retelling, like, I definitely think that if you are not familiar with Pride and Prejudice or you have just kind of a very vague idea of the story, I think you can still enjoy this book and get something out of it, but I think it is so clever and cool if you are very familiar with the story to pick up on how smart these decisions are that Melinda Taub made about the, the like, details of this story. Like, I just, it, it makes me, like, fangirl, because <laughs> um, I just thought it was so cool. You can clearly see how much Melinda Taub, like, knows the source material and how much she loves it, so I just thought that was very cool. Um, there is also a romantic element in this book that, like, kind of shocked me at how well it worked for me or how much I bought it. Um, I do think we could have had more development for that part, but I still thought it was very well done. Um, yeah, so I thought this was great. I gave it five stars. Again, it is a very, like, interesting book, um, and I think there are things about the main character or the narration that aren't going to click with everybody, but I loved it. I gave The Scandalous Confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch five stars. Next, I finished The Knife of Never Letting Go by Patrick Ness. This is the first book in the Chaos Walking trilogy, um, and I read this for the live show that I did with my lovely friend Olivia Savannah from Olivia's Catastrophe. It was part of my Not A Genre book club, but the live show was hosted and led by Olivia Savannah, so I will link that down below. Um, yeah, this so this was her pick, and I'm so glad she picked this because this has been a series I have gone <laughs> back and forth on for years about whether I was going to try it and if I thought I would like it because I had heard such different things um, from people I follow or friends of mine, some of whom love it, some of whom hate it. Like, it was, it was just, I had no idea. <laughs> um, and I actually had almost unhauled this series, I think, like, three different times, but I could never commit to it because I just had that feeling, I'm like, maybe it would work for me, though. So I'm so glad that I had the perfect excuse to get to this. And guys, I, like, this is not a perfect book, but I enjoyed it so much, and 
somehow, in all of the years that I was trying to make up my mind about whether to try this series or not, I somehow missed <laughs> in reviews. Like, people talk about the premise of this, which is, um, it's kind of a sci-fi dystopian. It's set in a world where, um, it's kind of like a new planet that has been colonized, and, um, so humans are living there now, and it's set in a community where, um, there was this illness that killed all of the women in the colony, um, and it also gave men the ability to hear each other's thoughts. Um, like, not just the ability, it's like they can't turn it off, it's called the noise, and it's always there, it's always present. And our main character is a young boy named Todd, who is right at the age, I think like around 13, where his community considers him like a man, um, so he's kind of, you know, about to go through that, and one day he stumbles across absolute silence. Like, there's no noise, there's no anything. Um, and that's kind of where the story starts. And so people would give that premise, and I I understand why. It is interesting, and that is true. That is a big part of what this book is about. Um, it is a very interesting, like, concept or setup for a story, but somehow I missed, <laughs> in all the years of, like, hearing people talk about this book, I was not aware that, like, yes, it is all of those things, but what this book is also doing is it is a scathing commentary on the inherent violence of toxic masculinity. <laughs> and I know that's not quite as catchy as, like, the premise, you know, like, the setup and everything, but um, if I had known that, I would have read this book so much earlier, because that kind of theme is, like, right up my alley. So I thought this was great, um, in incredibly emotional and hard to read at times, but I think it is so well done. I really, really felt for Todd. Um, he is frustrating, he makes mistakes, um, he does some things that he's not proud of, that he really regrets, but he is such a human character. He's so, like, I just, I was so invested in him. I wanted him to do better, and I was proud of him when he did. Like, I just, he's, he's really unlearning a lot of this horribly misogynistic thinking that he's grown up with, and I feel like even though we definitely see the way that has affected him. We also see, even from the beginning of the book, that he's fighting it, or that there are things that that he doesn't like, that he, that don't make sense to him about the way that he has been taught to view the world. Um, I thought that was really well done. I did know about the very, very sad part involving the dog. Um, I had been warned about that years and years ago before I even thought about trying this series, um, and it is, in fact, incredibly sad. Somehow sadder than I thought, but, like, the emotional impact of this book I think is very intentional, and it didn't feel cheap to me. Um, and also, like, with Todd as a main character. Like, I was saying how much I enjoyed him and how much, like, I felt for him, and it's funny because I actually tried to read this book once before, and I really wasn't clicking with it. I should mention that the writing style is very particular. It's, like, this kind of... <sighs> kind of, like, informal. It sort of sounds like southern U.S. in some parts, but, like, written phonetically sometimes. So there are certain spellings or certain, like, words that are left out. Like, it's a very intentional choice, but it's it makes just the very beginning of this book a little harder to get into, I think. And that, plus the fact that when we first meet Todd, he's being mean to his dog. <laughs> um, I, th I think those were some of the things that put me off the book the first time. And also just the fact that sometimes liking a book comes down to reading it at the right time. Um, I don't know if, like, you know, for whatever reason, I just wasn't in the mood for this kind of story when I first picked it up, but this time it really, really worked for me. Um, I ended up really loving the writing, and I love the way that the writing style plus kind of the other things that happen in the story. I think, like, one of the sort of smaller, like, themes or ideas of this book is also about, like, intelligence and language and like, stereotypes around that, um, and I think that was, like, very powerful, the way that this book did that in a very, like, subtle way. Um, I thought the characterization was fantastic. Technically, you don't find this out at the very beginning of the book, but I think it's something that a lot of people mention in the summary, so I don't really consider it a spoiler, um, but in very vague terms, you do end up meeting, um, a female character named Viola in this book, and I really loved her. Like, she's not a perspective character, but she didn't feel like she didn't feel like she was just the girl, you know, that that was her whole personality. Um, she felt like her own complete person, and I really, really loved her as a character as well. Um, I loved, like, the friendship of this book. Like, it just is so beautiful, and there are so many, like, 
quiet character moments that I absolutely loved so that even though there were parts of the plot I didn't like as much, like sci-fi dystopian is not my genre combo anyway, but I had also heard even from people who really like these books that there's a lot of like repetitive like traveling and running around and like running and getting caught and then like running and getting caught by different people and like all of that. So thankfully I was prepared for that because that was kind of, you know, repetitive or frustrating, um, especially for somebody who already doesn't care for journey books. But even with all of that, I loved these characters so much. I loved these themes so much. I loved this friendship and like this, like just the the humanness of this story that like it didn't even bother me. <laughs> so there are things that I think this book could have been could have done better, but I loved it so much. I think it did so much so well. I'm so invested in this. I'm absolutely going to be continuing the series. Um, and I gave the knife of never letting go four stars. Okay, I'm starting to lose the light, so let's go ahead and get through. I have just two more books. Um, so next I finished A Room with a View by E.M. Forster. Um, this was for Past at Classics. I will link that live show down below. Um, this is, of course, a classic, and um, it's a really short one, actually. And that plus the writing, I feel like makes a lot of sense why people recommend this as a good like starter if you're like wary about starting classics. Um, so I would definitely agree with that. We are following Lucy um, as our main character primarily, although we do kind of get other perspectives like mixed in um, and she is going with her cousin to um, a vacation in Italy for like a few weeks over the summer I think um, and she ends up cross crossing paths with this young man named George who's there with his father um, and it's about the relationship, the connection that develops between them um, even after they both leave Italy and they end up crossing paths again. I feel like I use that phrase a lot so I apologize. Um, yeah, so this was such an interesting book. I'm really glad I finally read it. Um, first off, the writing, absolutely gorgeous, impeccable, funny, just emotional, wonderful. Like the number of quotes I had for this book and the amount of time we spent in the live show just talking about different quotes incredible. <laughs> I think the writing alone would have made this worth it for me. Um, also partly because it is a very engaging style, even for modern readers, which I think also helps, um, and it helps to read quickly as well. I really enjoyed some of the side characters, um, especially, like, I was not expecting Mr. Beeb, I think is how you would say his name, um, to be such a well-developed character and also to be my favorite character. He's like this rector um, that the family is like close with or that they end up knowing. Um, and he was wonderful. The MVP of this book, truly. <laughs> um, so I thought he was great. I enjoyed some of the other side characters. Um, I think some of the like observations of this book on life and, you know, love and like family and like the pleasant and unpleasant parts of just you know, being a person in the world. I was very impressed by the relatability of this book, um, especially with certain characters, but there were things about the main story and also some of the main characterization that kept this from fully working for me. Um, like, I, I feel like the narration of the book was, like, incredibly thoughtful and profound and interesting. Um, again, there was a lot of humor in it, so, like, the narration around some characters was great. Like, Lucy, for example, like, her internal monologue was incredibly interesting and well done, but as a character, I don't feel like we got a lot of development for her. Like, I don't know if that distinction makes sense. Like, the narration of this book, which was centered on Lucy as a protagonist, like, that narration stuff was very interesting and was very thoughtful, but just looking at Lucy's characterization, I, I think wasn't as well done. And I also feel like George was very underdeveloped. Like he has a couple of like absolutely amazing like scenes and like speeches. And I just wish we had seen more of him throughout the book because like, I just, I don't know. And I, I wasn't sold on the main relationship either because I feel like both of the leads were fairly underdeveloped compared to some of the side characters and also just didn't spend a lot of time together. And then also um, there was quite a lot of xenophobia in this book. And, you know, you kind of unfortunately expect a certain amount of that going into classics. And I also don't want to, like, conflate the way that other European countries are portrayed in this book with the way that, like, you know, Global South countries, for example, are, are portrayed in Western media, because obviously those are very different things. Um, so I'm not trying to, like, equate that. But I think some of the ways that, like, Italian people and, like, Italy's, like, cities and, like, country and everything in particular were compared to like English society I think was very uncomfortable and unpleasant to read um because like there is a lot of this book where Ian Forster is like critiquing like the English tourist and it's very funny it's very biting and clever so he definitely is like criticizing some of the like tourism 
elements, you know. Um, but there was also a lot of this book, like, we barely saw any, like, actual Italian people, which I always think is weird, um, in stories that are, like, set abroad to, like, not see any of the people who actually live there. There were very few people that we did, and they were all kind of one-off characters. Um, and every time, like, we actually saw Italian people who lived there or, like, who interacted with one of our main characters, every time it was always portrayed and written about in a way that, like, they're dirty and, like, stupid and poor, like, these, these hot-headed peasants who were just, like, violent and, like, dirty and very, like, animalistic. There's, like, a, a moment that I won't spoil, but, like, it's a significant moment for, like, Lucy and George, and it is, like, incredibly weird the way that is portrayed. Um, and it's also, it's just so hypocritical and annoying that, like, all these characters they are going to Italy to, like, view the art and these, like, beautiful, like, pieces and buildings and, like, all of this, and, like, they're, they're going here for that, but the actual people who live here are, like, dumb, ugly, murdering peasants. I, I don't know, it's just, it's very weird. It's like, you kind of want to ask, like, Ian Forster, like, you do realize that, like, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo were Italian, right? Like, <laughs> Do you know that? So yeah, those are just some reasons that, like, the chunk of the book taking place in in Italy um, was not my favorite, um, even though some really good scenes between characters happened there. Just, like, the whole setting, the way that setting was used, the portrayal of things and that happened there and people who live there, not my favorite. So, like, I had kind of mixed feelings about this. There were some things I loved about it, like I said, the writing um, and some of the side characters and, like, some of the ideas, but... Like, I, I definitely want to read more from E.M. Forster, but this isn't, like, a favorite for me. Um, and I gave A Room with a View three and a half stars. And then finally, the last book I finished, um, I think technically this one and A Room with a View I finished, like, after the end of September, but I'm including them all together. I read Street Magic by Tamora Pierce. This is the second book in the Circle Open series, um, which is the sequel series to Circle of Magic. This is part of that read-along The Beautifully Bookish Bethany is hosting. I, I feel like I don't need to spend a ton of time on this one because I continue to love this series. <laughs> I love Tamora Pierce, the way that she writes characters and themes, and the way that she balances the tone of her books, I think is incredibly impressive. Um, like, I feel like there are... I don't want to say there's not a lot of authors. I think there are fewer authors than I would like <laughs> who really excel at balancing really dark or heavy topics with the more light-hearted elements. In the second book, we are following Briar specifically, so this is like his book, um, and he and Rose Thorne are in another like kingdom um, or like country, I forget exactly how they define it, and Briar ends up coming across a girl who has stone magic, and Briar's a plant mage, he does not have stone magic, but because they don't really have access to an actual teacher for her, he ends up kind of taking her in as as his apprentice. So seeing Briar as a teacher was so much fun, it was really wonderful. Um, and then also, while he and Rose Thorne are staying here, they end up getting caught in the crossfire kind of between, um, with all this like gang warfare going on. Um, and that's, that's pretty much the plot of this one. There's kind of like a little bit of a mystery element that I thought was really well done. Um, I continue to love these characters and like the magic and um, just thematically, the things that these books do and the way that all of these characters are so well written. There were some genuinely, like, creepy, kind of horrifying moments in this one about, like, you know, knowing knowing what was going on when the characters didn't, and it wasn't in a frustrating way. It was in a way that was just very, very effective. Um, as far as the plot, like, the gang warfare thing was not, like, especially interesting to me as, like, the main story, um, but I just, I love these characters and everything else about these books so much that, like, I still gave it five stars. Like, it was still incredibly good. Um, yeah, so those were the books. The rest of the books I read in September. Please comment down below. Let me know if you have read any of these, what you thought of them. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!